Welcome to the Sunday Morning Message with Pastor Nick Stringer, brought to you from Creekside Church in Brookville, Indiana. Creekside Church, where the Spirit flows. Good morning. Open your Bibles, if you would please, to John chapter 14. We're going to be looking at those verses that were just read to us. That's verses 1 through 3. title of today's message is, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. And the focus of our message today will be on an event known as the rapture. The rapture of the church. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus says. If I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come again and receive you to myself. And therefore, where I am, there you will be also. Great promise that Jesus gives to his disciples and to the church during what is known as an upper room discourse. Now, the upper room discourse is a conversation between Jesus and his disciples in the upper room of the Last Supper. And so these are words of comfort from Jesus to his disciples less than a week before he was betrayed and crucified only to rise again from death. Amen. This is a difficult time for everyone at the table of the Last Supper. Jesus was about to be betrayed, then viciously arrested and abused before being condemned to the cross where he would suffer a horrible physical death. As for the disciples, they were confronted with Jesus leaving them and not knowing where he was going and know, or knowing if he would ever come back again. This is certainly a time of grief and lamenting for all involved. You know, every time we have a national crisis, a world crisis, or even a local crisis, it, um, especially in election years, Right. People like to talk about the end times. They like to know what's going to happen. When is the sign of the apocalypse coming upon us? Uh, the other uh, evening I had the pleasure. You know, I wouldn't have probably considered it a pleasure years ago, <laughs> but it was a pleasure at this particular time. A hummingbird. My wife has a hummingbird feeder on the front porch. And usually whenever I see a hummingbird around that feeder, it's flapping its wings, right? However many times per second it does. And it doesn't stop. And it goes to around each one of those little pods and gets a little food out of that little feeder. But on this particular occasion, that hummingbird came to a complete rest, a stop. In other words, its wings were not flapping. And it just kind of hopped around on its feet to each one of the pods on that little feeder. And I said, wow, and I was sitting right there. And I said, wow, that hummingbird feels very safe, very safe. That's exactly what Jesus wants you to feel. When you think of the times of the end, my friends, you are not entitled to fear. You have been served with comfort and peace during those times. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled but have comfort in knowing that what is coming in the end is only the beginning of a glorious eternity for all of those who love and trust Jesus Christ so that's what we have to look forward to in reality the end is not the end but it is just the beginning for those who love the Lord the so-called end times events are not a cause of concern for Christians, but something we should look upon with delight. It is the beginning of many good things for us that will last in eternity. Let not your heart be troubled. Our application and principle for today is this. Christians have the Lord's promise that he is preparing a place for us in heaven. Therefore, we will rest assured in the comfort and peace of knowing we will always be with the Lord because fear has no place with us. You see, when fear comes into our lives, we need to tell ourselves and remind ourselves of what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.7. God did not give us a spirit of fear. When fear comes in, we say this is not from God. 
God did not give this to me. He's not giving this to me. This is from somewhere else. Either Satan or the flesh. My fear is not from God. God has given me a spirit. That spirit, where does that come from? That's the Holy Spirit. How do you get that? You receive Jesus Christ through faith. And he says, I will give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God to reside within you. That spirit there is not one of fear. It is one of boldness and strength. It is one of power and love. And it is one of discipline and sound mind. That is the spirit of God. And that is the spirit that God has given us us and so we can rest assured with comfort and peace knowing that hey the end that's okay we're fine with that uh, tribulation coming upon the earth because we know what God has in store for us we don't look forward to it with dread we look forward to it with joy and so that is quite a perspective my friends Every Sunday I come up here, I don't count it as a waste of time. And I certainly do appreciate the fact that you give me your attention. I appreciate that. And I value that very much. Which is why I speak to you in very bold and plain terms. Living in fear is not your calling. You are called to live by faith. And in strength and power of the Spirit of God. That is what we are called to do. And so when we look at the rapture of the church, first of all, we want to understand what is the rapture of a church. You hear this term rapture, which you can't find in the scriptures. The word itself is not in the Bible, but it uses another word. There's a word, a phrase, you will, caught up together with the Lord. And that means to snatch, to seize, to take. And that's exactly what is going to happen to Christians At the rapture, we are going to be taken by the Lord and we are going to meet him in the air. There was an author who was writing a book about how a soldier waits. When a soldier goes into combat, uh, particularly in a hostile environment, it can bring on a lot of emotions and a lot of grief. And this author wrote a book about it and he interviewed all these soldiers. And one of the things that helped bring them comfort was thinking about the people that they had back home that they loved. And so writing letters to them is a big source of comfort. But one thing about being a soldier who was waiting, uh, they don't know if the last time they saw their loved ones will be the last time. And so there's a lot of unknown. And I believe that our relationship with Jesus Christ is the same way. There's a lot of of unknown and there's a lot of similarities to a soldier who is waiting to go back home but there's one assurance that we do have from jesus is that we will be reunited with the lord again now for us who have faith in christ i use the word reunited because we had an encounter with jesus when we surrendered to him in faith Now, there are many who have yet to be united with Jesus. And so that can bring fear. That can bring the unknown. Why? Because the Spirit of God is not present within them. Because they have not come to Jesus Christ in faith. But when we come in faith to Christ, that fear is replaced by faith. And so we have that, and we have the assurance of knowing now, The rapture of the church is not the second coming of Jesus Christ. Those are separate, independent events, okay? The second coming of Jesus Christ is different than the rapture. In the rapture, the church, first the dead in Christ will rise, and that is those who have already died that are believers and have faith in the Lord. Their bodies will be called up to meet their spirits in the air and they will be changed. And at that moment, us too will be called in a twinkling of an eye and we will uh, follow them and meet the Lord in the air. So there's not a physical coming back of Jesus to the earth at the rapture. It's us believers, the church, meeting him 
in the air and then being with him. And it's also not Armageddon. The rapture is not Armageddon. Armageddon takes place after the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. Believers come back with Jesus. The physical appearance of Jesus Christ comes back, and there ensues the battle. It's really not much of a battle. It's the Lord opening up his mouth and wiping out all of the enemies who have gathered against him, smiting them, destroying them. That's the second coming of Christ, and that is Armageddon. So the rapture is different. Those events have marked periods of time. In other words, what I'm saying is, by what's happening on the earth, it can be determined when Jesus is coming back. Because at the rapture, that will kick off the time when the seven-year tribulation begins on the earth. So you could start counting the days if you happen to be left behind, which I hope you're not. I hope you'll put your faith in Jesus Christ, but in case you are, you, in case you're reluctant, in case you just uh, haven't been willing to take that step of faith let, yet and surrender to the Lord, well, when you see the rest of us go and you wonder where we're at, start counting the days, seven years you'll be on this earth facing tribulation, and at the midway point of that tribulation, after three and a half years, the Antichrist will reveal himself. He will reveal who he is, and then that will be a time, that second three and a half years of the seven year will be a time of great tribulation. Things will happen on this earth that have never happened before and like the likes of which will never happen again. It is a time of great judgment. Now, what makes the rapture unique is it's imminent, which means it could happen at any moment. We don't know when it's going to happen. See, with the second coming in the rapture, or the, uh, excuse me, the battle of Armageddon, we know that's going to take place after the tribulation. But we don't know when the rapture will take place. And that's the significance of imminence, which means at any moment, that thief in the night, at any time, you and I could be called back up. You and I have back up. We could be called up. For the first time. So the rapture is our blessed hope. Titus 2.13 says this. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. The rapture is the immediate translation of believers into the presence of Jesus Christ. One moment we're here and in the next we are united with Jesus where we will always be with him this was a mystery that was revealed to paul this is not something that the old testament believers knew about this was a new mystery that paul had revealed to him from the lord that he is sharing to the church he says i show you a mystery we will not all sleep in other words we will not all die but those who remain and are alive will be caught up into the air and be with the Lord. That event is known as the rapture. The believers will meet the Lord in the air. First Thessalonians 4.17 Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You see no physical return of Jesus meeting him in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. You know, it's the Lord, he gives this promise here about I go and prepare a place for you. And I think, what is that place going to be? What is that going to look like? You know, because when you think of God, you think about the uniqueness of each individual and you think about how he has created each one of us so affectionately and tenderly in love and we're all unique and different personalities and you just wonder what does your place look like and what does your place look like and what does my place look like? what's it going to look like how is Jesus using our unique personalities and identities to create a place for us in heaven this might be something like what we like here on earth. I don't know. Isn't that a neat thought, though, to think, how will your place be different than mine? Will they all be the same? Will we all just like the same things at that point in time? Or will there be a little twist 
of uniqueness there. I happen to believe that because we've all been created differently, yet we're all created in the image of God. And so I believe we'll all each have a different place and we'll be able to visit each other's places and we'll be able to say, hey, look at how God did your place. Hey, look at how God did my place. And we'll be able to compare. And then some of us will get into an argument. Well, I wanted that. That won't happen in heaven, will it? <laughs> no, sir, there will be none of that. But it was a mystery that was revealed to the Lord. So believers will immediately meet the Lord in the air. But the rapture is also a time where Christians will be glorified. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says this. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. So that right there is indicating that first, those who preceded us in death will meet the Lord in the air and those who are alive and remain will then follow them. And this will all happen in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, in an instant. And we'll be together with the Lord in the places that he has created for us. It's called glorification, that moment where we get that new body. You see, he says, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, that the perishable must put on imperishable and the mortal must put on immortality. So in other words, our bodies will be changed in that moment. And the body that you have now will not be the body that you will have in eternity. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that would be a source of comfort for many of us. Yeah, those aches and pains. But I tell you, our bodies in the eternity will be equipped for eternity. So they will not be subject to decay. They will not be subject to disease. There will not be any disease. They will be fit for us to perfectly endure all of eternity. And they will be glorious and pain-free. And I suspect that we'll be pleased with our bodies in eternity. And it will be a, a time where we will receive that instant glorification of the Lord. Perfectly conformed to his image. Sinless, new, imperishable, immortal bodies fit for eternity. That's what happens at the rapture. We meet the Lord in the air and we are glorified. We receive new resurrection bodies fit for all eternity that's a beautiful thing so that's what the rapture is so now that we have an understanding of the rapture why would God do this why would God remove all believers from the earth in an instant and then leave all unbelievers behind you know, it's going to be an interesting time when this happens because there's going to be, sadly to say, there'll be many people who were churchgoers. They're going to be left behind and the people who are also there with them are going to say, well, I thought you went to church all the time. Well, I did. Well, then why are you here? And then they're going to have to come face to face with that question. Why aren't you up there? Why did you get left behind? The answer can be summed up in a word called surrender. You can't be taken by God when you're holding on to the things down here. If I am holding on to my possessions, if I am holding on to my money, God's money, if I am holding on to things down here that are keeping me from surrendering all to the Lord, well, He can see that in my heart. And therefore, I could probably be left behind. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, He's not asking to be a part of your life. He is asking to be all of your life. He wants every decision to be made with him in mind. He wants everything you do to be made with glorification of him in mind. Number one is God. 
You've sang the song many times. I surrender all. Well, have you? Do you surrender your relationships to God? Do you surrender your children to God? Do you surrender your wife or your husband to God? Do you give God your home? He gave it to you. God gave you your home. Surrender it back to him. God, I want to give you these children that you have given me for a short time. You've given me a responsibility, and my responsibility is to turn them back to you. Surrender. If we don't let go of what is down here, we may not get taken up when the Lord calls the rapture. You know, we, <clears throat> my wife and I saw that movie Twisters the other night. And when those twisters came, do you know what they were doing? They were holding on to things for dear life. They didn't want to get sucked up into the twister. They were holding on. Well, when Jesus calls, you don't want to be holding on. You want to let go. That way he can take you. That's one twister you do want to be caught up in. You do not want to be stuck down here because of a lack of trust and a lack of faith. Go all in and surrender it all to the Lord and let him take you at the appointed time. Why will God rapture his church? Well, quite frankly, he's going to keep his promise. His promise is, hey, if I go and prepare a place for you, most assuredly, I will return. I will receive you to myself, and you will always be where I am. That is a promise he wants you to hold dear so that you can walk through this earth with assurance, confidence, and joy. Not pouty face, right? Where do you go to church at? Mm. Don't tell him you go here. <laughs> if you if you got that face, don't you dare tell him you go here. I you directly reflect my ministry. <laughs> That's just a joke, folks. That's just a joke. You're taking this a little too seriously now. So God is going to rapture His church. Why? Because He is going to keep us from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians chapter one verse ten. Look what it says: and to wait for His Son Jesus from heaven, whom He raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. That's why Jesus is going to rapture His church because He wants to save us. You see, the rapture is going to be a time of judgment on the world like the world has never seen. Oh, we do not want to be here during that time. Trumpet judgments, vile judgments, bold judgments. We do not want to be here. We're going to get into that next week when we talk about the tribulation but for now we want to be encouraged and we want to understand why is God going to take his church well because it's consistent with his character isn't it God has always intervened and spared his children from wrath to come we can look back at the beginning go all the way back to the garden and look what happened when sin came into the world what did he do he clothed Adam and Eve with coats of skin and he made a promise to them, Genesis 3, verse 15, that he was going to bring a Savior to defeat this curse of sin. He has always provided and made a provision. What about the ark? Look at the ark. He looked down upon the earth and he saw the thoughts and intents of every man's heart. Genesis 6, 5 was only evil continually. Well, that's pretty evil, isn't it? But he looked down at Noah, a man of righteousness who trusted the Lord. He had faith. And he said, no, I need you to build an ark. Why? Oh, just build an ark. It's going to rain. What's rain? No, he, he, he went forward with the work and he continued it. It showed his faith. His faith was defined by his actions. He built that ark. Humanity was spared. And we are all descendants of Noah and his family. Humanity was spared. He saved his children. We look at Joseph, how he was taken from his family, sold into slavery, and how God used that to save the people of Israel during a time of famine. We look back and we see the Exodus, how God took the people of Israel, led them out 
from their slavery in Egypt and led them into the promised land. He parted the Red Sea and showed to them many miracles and times where they could trust him. If you will trust me in this wilderness, if you will trust me in this time, I will show you that I will spare you. And then, of course, we have Jesus, the sinless Savior sent to the world, who was sent on our behalf, took our punishment, what we deserved. And by trusting in him, we are spared from the wrath to come. Not just the tribulation on the earth, but from an eternal hell. He rescues us from the fires of hell. Jesus does. That is our great salvation. It's consistent with God's character. That's why he spares us. It fulfills who God is. A compassionate father. A good shepherd. My friends, it makes no sense that God would leave his children here to go through the tribulation and then call us up afterwards. That is inconsistent with the character of God and scriptures simply don't seem to make that a logical solution but taking us out before that judgment comes down because that is a time of Jacob's trouble for the Jewish people and it's also a time for the unbelieving world the tribulation is reserved for unbelievers not believers so not all, only will he keep us from the wrath to come but he's going to reward and unite the church. That's why the rapture will occur. To reward and unite the church. At that time there will be what's called a judgment seat of Christ. While tribulation is happening on the earth. When we're with the Lord. We will be receiving rewards for our service here on earth. There's crowns to be handed out. There's five crowns that the Bible defines that believers could possibly receive. There's an imperishable crown. Given to those who will endure faithfully through difficult times, a crown of rejoicing where God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There's a crown of righteousness for those who trusted in his righteousness and not their oh, excuse me, own righteousness. There's a crown of glory for those who wait eagerly for him and a crown of life for those who bravely confront all forms of persecution. It'll be a time of great reward for Christian believers during the rapture. But it'll also be a time where we're united together. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a time where the entire body of Christ will be brought together as one. And the bridegroom, Jesus himself, we will be adorned in white, blameless and spotless. And Jesus, the bridegroom, we will be united with him forever to stay. And nothing will separate us from the love of God. We will always be with the Lord. We are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. The marriage supper of Lamb. Revelation 19.9 then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these words of God are true. Now, I'll close with this point here. So these are the promises of God that we have as believers that we could look forward to the rapture. But what about those who are left behind? Look, we don't want anybody to be left behind. But there will be. There will be many who are left behind. What about those who didn't get taken by the Lord and are left on earth to endure a seven-year tribulation? Well, this is what we know about God. He will continue to offer salvation. So if you may be asking yourself, is it too late for those left behind to be saved? No, it's not too late. But it's going to be difficult. Please don't be the person who says to yourself, well, you know what? I'll just wait for the rapture to happen. And then when I see that, then I'll know. And then I'll put my trust in Jesus Christ. My friends, during the tribulation period, there are going to be deluding spirits. They're going to confuse the people that are left behind. And it is going to be very difficult 
for people to get saved out of the tribulation. There will be people who do, but it will be at the risk of their physical lives. First, they have to reject the mark of the beast. Because those who are left behind at the tribulation, they're going to be encouraged, ordered to take the mark of a beast on the right hand or on the forehead. A lot of folks are now starting to think that this may take the form of a QR code. You may get a QR code stamped on your forehead. I don't know what the mark is, what it's going to be, but I do know this. If you get left behind, don't accept anything on your right hand or your forehead. Reject that. But there'll be a deluding spirits. It's going to be difficult for those who are left behind to get saved because they're going to have to reject what they see. Because they're going to see the Antichrist perform some miraculous things. And they're going to be drawn to him through their flesh. But you have to deny that if you're left behind. And you have to uh, have something that you failed to have right now while you're here. And that is faith in Jesus Christ. You have to be willing to surrender. I said surrender. You had to, you're going to have to surrender your physical body. Because if you acknowledge Jesus Christ during the time of tribulation, you will immediately be killed. The Bible says beheaded. A lot of believers will be beheaded. So this will not be an easy time for people. So please, if you're on the fence, don't wait for the rapture to make a decision. Don't live by sight. Live by faith. It's time to step fully into trusting Jesus Christ. Don't be one of those people who reason themselves right to the fires of hell. We are here to live by faith. Not by what we see, but, what, but trusting in what we don't know and cannot see. The rapture will be a difficult time for many who are left here, but I have to tell you, I see this as an act of mercy and patience as a loving father. It's another opportunity where God extends an offer of salvation for those left behind. They see what's happened. It's a time of great confusion, a time of great chaos. And they have another opportunity. Because God is patient. Wow, is he patient. So patient. Have you really considered how patient God has been with you uh, just you know if you get a little time this afternoon before you take your little nap maybe just spend some time reflecting what are the things I've done in my life just jot down a little list <laughs> and just consider how patient God has been with you to endure and to continue providing these opportunities be a time of great judgment on the earth those left behind like i said they must reject the mark of the beast revelation 20 verse 4 then i saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them and i saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of jesus and because of the word of god and those who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. For those left on earth, it will be decision time all over again. And it might be decision time right now. Right now, you may be struggling to make a decision for Jesus Christ. You've gotten to a point where the answers just aren't there you're not getting the message of the sign that you want. God just doesn't seem to be giving you the evidence that you say you need in order to fully trust in him. And there's a reason for that because God requires faith. God requires trust. Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, it is impossible to please God without faith impossible as much as I love seeing a church every Sunday I have to tell you this 
Your just being here isn't enough. It requires faith. You have to surrender. You have to let go and allow that tornado called Jesus Christ to take you. If you want him to take you and bring you to a safe place, let go and surrender all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you, Lord, for your patience which just seemingly endures on and on and on. You're such a loving and compassionate Father, such a good and holy God. And Lord, I want to thank you for extending this time we have right now. If there's anyone in our presence today, Lord, that can hear the sound of my voice, Father, that they would surrender themselves now to the work and plan of Jesus Christ if you want to be taken in the rapture and not see the seven year tribulation on this earth then you need to trust in Jesus and trust in Jesus right now it's a very urgent matter we've had a lot of deadly fatalities on our roadways recently in our prayers and thoughts or with those families that is such a such a difficult difficult time I can't imagine being one of them who are grieving right now so so terrible well father we're not promised any time on this earth and we just don't know and it's time to make a decision and it's time to trust with faith in Christ. You can decide right now, dear Jesus, I trust you. You are Lord and God. I believe in you, and I want you to take me in the rapture when it comes. I want to be with you for all eternity. Lord, we thank you again, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Sunday message by Pastor Nick Stringer at Creekside Church in Brookville, Indiana. For more information, you can go to www.creekside-church.org and find us on the website. Once again, you've been listening to the Sunday Message with Pastor Nick Stringer.